We're here to do the job, and we don't rattle. Hello and welcome to Rotted Review of the Day, and today I am taking a look at the 2007 John Cusack, Samuel L. Jackson movie, 1408. I needed a palate cleanser. Uh, I, I had watched several bad movies in a row, very uh, amateurish, hammy, bad acting, terrible movies in a row, and I'm going to, you know, if I haven't reviewed them already, I, I'm going to. I I don't necessarily review things in the order in which I watch them, but I needed to watch a good movie. And this has actually become not a point of contention, but a point of conversation between my fiance and I. Uh, I'll say, okay, I, I need to watch a, you know, I get home from work and I say, I need to watch a horror movie for the, uh, you know, Rotted Review channel. She'll say, okay, well, what are you going to watch? I'm like, I don't know yet. And she's like, well, if it's a good one, then I'll watch it with you. I'm like, I don't know if it's a good one or not. We haven't watched it yet. <laughs> Um, so, uh, typically, uh, I'm left to, uh, watch, uh, my horror movies in my, uh, office alone, uh, to gauge whether or not they're good ones. And I make the argument, well, that's when you find the gems. That's when you find movies like, uh, Dark Song and going GM Haunted Asylum and so on and so forth. And, you know, that, that, that's what really makes it worth it. And, uh, haven't been able to <laughs> sway her too much on that one. Um, so as far as, um, you know, testing the, and I admit a lot of this channel is, uh, finding the, uh, smaller, lesser known movies and doing reviews of those, which have in my experience, a higher ratio of bad to good, uh, than your normal fare. Uh, so that that's in her defense on that one. <laughs> but, uh, regardless, I did need something to watch that I knew was good. Uh, I, I needed to cleanse my palate, and 1408 was a good choice. That's This is a movie I've seen a dozen times or more, and it is entertaining with every rewatch. Uh, the first time I watched it, it scared the absolute bejesus out of me. Uh, but every subsequent rewatch, I mean, now that I know what happens and all the, the, you know, jump scares and so forth, you know, I, I have them down. Um, <clears throat> they, uh, it, it's still entertaining and the rewatches are still worth doing. Um, so I'm glad I got to watch it. And uh, because I watched it now, it's fresh in my mind and I feel like I can review it. Um, so this is a movie that, in my estimation, by all rights, shouldn't work. Uh, it, take, uh, it takes a lot of the sins of films that I've pointed out in the past and it exemplifies them. But it somehow at every turn is the exception that proves the rule. Um, I'm going to go ahead and throw up the categories here. As always, four different categories, each one worth up to 25 points for a total possible score of 100 points. And this film follows the character of Mike Enslin, who is an author that has a limited fan base. He basically goes around the country and finds uh, haunted uh, blanks and then writes a book about them. So, you know, it could be anything from like haunted uh, motels to haunted whatevers um, and then compiles books on them and, uh, you know, has them as kind of haunted travel guides for the macabre fan. And uh, you, you get the sense that he makes a okay living off of it, uh, but it's not exactly what he wants to be doing. Uh, this is just an example of where his, uh, various choices in life and, uh, pitfalls that have befallen him, uh, have led him to this point. And we get, uh, we explore more of his backstory as the film goes on. Uh, but for right now, what happens is he receives a postcard, from the Dolphin Hotel in New York City. And all it says is, do not stay in room 1408, I believe. I don't have it in front of me. I'm paraphrasing. Um, and uh, so he takes that as a little bit of a, you know, okay, cute little challenge there. Starts looking into it. And uh, yeah, he, you know, when he tries to reserve the room 1408 at the Dolphin Hotel, he is not allowed to. Uh, the operator hangs up on him when he insists. And through his agent and his agent's lawyers, he manages to squeeze his way in uh, through anti-discrimination lawsuit uh, threats. When he gets to the hotel, he is greeted by the hotel manager, uh, played by Samuel L. Jackson, who does everything in his power to dissuade him from staying in room 1408. 
uh, you know, treats them to this, you know, ancient bottle of uh, liquor and, uh, you know, free comp on anything he wants and, you know, stay in any other room. He even goes so far as to provide him with all of the documents, notes, dossier, and pictures, and so on and so forth of room 1408. Uh, and just says, you know, take this, take all my notes, say you stayed there and just go, you know, just, just leave and say, you know, nobody will know the difference. I'll back your story. Uh, but just don't stay there. Nevertheless, Mike is insistent and he does stay there. And as soon as he does, things start going weird, as you might expect, uh, just by the tone of the film, uh, you know, leading up to this moment. Uh, and the, it, it becomes a bit of a battle of wills between Mike and this uh, omnipresent force within the room or the room itself, as, uh, you know, as, as it's been described. There are that this is OK. The, the movie takes off from there. That, I mean, that's pretty much all the plot I'm going to get into without getting any kind of spoilery uh, elements to it. Um, but uh, suffice it to say, this does have the room playing with Mike like a cat plays with a mouse. Um, and that's something that I've described in previous videos before of movies where I don't particularly like it. And the reasoning for that is, uh, and this is what I mean by the exception that proves the rule, is omnipresent forces that can control time and space and uh, you know, the minute one character starts getting a, you know, an up on them, uh, all of a sudden it's like, no, nope, you know, reverse, you know, change things. You know, it, it takes away a lot of dramatic tension because at no point, uh, you know, once they break that barrier and we have a plot element involved in which the evil pre uh, presence can do anything they want to the world and to the character, then at that point it starts to become boring. Just kind of as a rule, uh, because at, at, at that point, no matter what your main character does, you're sitting there watching it. You have another, you know, you're half an hour into the movie. It's done its character introductions. You're now in act two. The, you know, all the establishment's been done. And now the, you know, evil has presented itself. And now we have a situation. You have another hour of watching this thing. And no matter what the main character does in the back of your head, you're thinking, nah, the evil is just going to make it not happen. You know, whatever device or tool or trap the main character says, it's like, nah, evil is just going to make it not happen. They can control time and space. You know, when they're that powerful, it becomes boring. And in this case, it doesn't. <laughs> this is, again, the exception that proves the rule. I thought this was absolutely entertaining throughout. Um, the room versus Mike Enslin, I thought was a dynamic that always worked well. You know, you always had a notion that the room always had the upper hand, but it never made it boring somehow. Um, there is an element of this one that takes place. I think, uh, I would say <sighs> spanning the time of the end of act two and the beginning of act three. Um, and I'm really going to try and phrase this carefully to avoid spoilers because this is a major element of the movie that really it hit me in the gut hard, but there was a one-two punch that The Room did that I thought was one of the best, most terrible Machiavellian mind game things that has ever befallen a horror movie victim. And the first part was just darn clever in the level of determination and patience uh, that The Room would have in order to do this. And the second... Uh, of the one, two punches, you know, just one right after the other, uh, was one of the most heartbreaking, heart wrenching things. I had I, I was like, it was just terrible to watch in the best way possible to watch the Mike Enslin character have to go through this one, two punch and then come out the other end of it. So another thing that this movie did that is something that typically doesn't work, but for some reason, and this one did is having characters uh, or having a single character in an isolated environment for the bulk of the movie is typically a frowned upon no-no. Uh, it is something that will send uh, producers and distributors running for the hills. Uh, but in this case, it works. John Cusack did a fantastic job with uh, his narration and uh, you know talking to himself and keeping the tempo going. 
And hats off to him for that one. That definitely affected the acting score as well as uh, Samuel L. Jackson's performance and the dynamic between the two definitely uh, affected the acting score here. Um, The only other uh, exception that proves the rule that I can think of where this really worked was the first half of Evil Dead 2. So I have a feeling if I continue on, I'm going to be repeating myself a lot more than I'd like. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up and just say that at 89 out of 100 points, This is not a movie that I would recommend. This is a movie that I would consider to be a rotted reviews must watch. If you are a horror movie fan and you have not seen 1408, clear your calendar, free up your evening, pop some popcorn, sit down and watch it. I would absolutely recommend this one uh, as a must watch. So thank you very much for joining me here today. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. If you like these videos, please click like and subscribe. And if you want to support me further, my Patreon link is below. Remember next time you want to watch a horror movie, first make sure that it's good and rotted.